Praise the Lord. How faithful is a God that we serve and His generosity to work healings and miracles and divine blessings that He bestows upon us continuously. Serving God is never a a promise that you won't go through a trial, a difficulty, a challenge, or for that matter, it doesn't mean you won't get sick and you won't ever hurt and won't ever injure yourself. But serving Christ means that in through all the trials you go through, you can see the faithfulness of the hand of Almighty God. You can see the support and feel the energy of one who when Normally, you'd be totally cast down, helpless, and without any strength at all. You find that there is one that reaches down his hands and begins to lift you up above the shadows. Begins to bring a restoration of life. Brings a hope deep down inside. I don't know about you, but me and many others like me have gone through trials that were bigger than we were. They were so enormous that we just didn't have the strength to get through them. In fact, without Christ, we would have crumbled beneath the load and felt like many others in the world that we are hopeless and helpless with nowhere to turn. But because Christ came into my life and found me, because He searched me out and He searched you out, I found grace. Everybody say grace. And because of grace, mercy came upon my life. The unmerited favor of God. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I didn't purchase it. Jesus reached down his hand and lifted me above every shadow. So what I want to say to you this morning is is he is bigger than anything you face. He is a shield to you when the fiery darts of the enemy come flying at you. And the Lord will be a shield if you will trust Him. The Bible is filled with that little word, trust. Trust. Trust is something that we develop over time with people. And sometimes trust is broken and a breach and fragile. And we struggle because of that. So it takes time to reestablish trust. But let me talk to you for a moment about trust where Jesus is concerned. You can trust Him. He'll never let you down. He'll never leave you. He'll never walk away from you no matter how bad it gets. He will never leave you alone. He said, I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. But I'll go with you all the way to the end of the world. That's a promise of God. And so we need Him to help us as we build up our strength of trust. And trust grows as we establish and as we build upon it. It'll help us. Just three verses I want to read in the 115th Psalm. That's verses 9, 10, and 11. Where the psalmist said, O O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Three times. Three times. Now, you know, I'm not necessarily the most intelligent person there is. Okay? But there's one thing that I do know. That if it's stressed over and over and over again, it's important. Okay? The reason that we repetitiously do things over and over 
and over is so we'll get better at it. Because it's important to us. Now, uh, how many of you here this morning grew up in the age of uh, calculators and computers and you went to school and that they allow you to carry a calculator and a computer with you? Would you raise your hand? I mean, there's no, I mean, there's nobody here that just a few, I mean, you got a calculator and a computer that you're able to use in school. You know, when I went to school, you know what our calculator was? There you go. Let's see. What they did was taught us our multiplication tables. And we did it over and over and over and over again. And you know what we used to say? What is the use of this? How in the world am I ever going to use this in life? We didn't see the importance of it, did we? Let me tell you, as I became older... And I took a dollar, and, and, and I know a dollar ain't worth very much nowadays. I don't even know how many pieces of bubble gum you buy for a dollar anymore. But, you know, we used to buy three of them for a penny. Yeah. That's why we had our jaws all blowed out with bubble gum. You know, we chew. You know, I, I know a dollar is not worth a whole lot anymore. But, but when I got to where I had a dollar... And I pulled up to the gas station, and I went in there. And I put some gas in my vehicle, and I took my dollar in there, and I didn't need that whole dollar to fill it up. And you say, what? How many of you remember when gasoline was under 30 cents a gallon? Come on, you old folks, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many young folks wish it was 30 cents a gallon? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, you see, yeah, that's where we live in life. But, but what happened was by learning those multiplication tables, I knew how much money I was supposed to have. When I worked on my job and I worked and I worked and I got my check at the end of the week, I knew how much money I was supposed to have because I knew how much time I worked. Why? Because I had learned something that was important. So what I want to do this morning is I hope you'll learn something that's important to your life. What the Scripture said three times in this same little passage is, is that we are to trust in the Lord because He is our shield, He is our protector, and that He will guide us through. And in a little bit, I'm going to tell you a little story here in the Bible that actually took place. It is true that took place there. So what we need to know is that God is making it very clear. And this is who he addressed this to. First he addressed it to O Israel, which was his people, the nation that he had chosen as his chosen people that he was going to protect. He was going to watch after them, that he would be their help and their shield. The second thing was he said to the house of Aaron, which was the priestly office that he had ordained, that they were to carry the word, to carry the truth, to carry the light, to carry the tabernacle, the temple that was there, to show the people how great God was, to honor him in the presence of the people. What they were supposed to do was to honor him at all times, honor him in all situations. I believe it's still true today that the priestly order should be honoring God with their life every single day we are to honor God in what we do for God promises to be their help and their shield thirdly he sends this out to ye that fear the Lord how many Lord fears do I have here this morning I mean you fear the Lord 
Okay, you say, well, I don't know about fearing the Lord. Well, how many of you that when the, the storm is raging, the wind begins to blow, and lightning's popping all around you, that you start uh, uh, calling on the Lord? Uh huh. That shows you fear the Lord. There, my dad was this way. My dad was kind of a, you know, he was an older man. And my dad, whenever the storms begin to come and the thunder clasp and and the lightning begin to flash, he said, "You kids, sit down." He said, this is the Lord's work. Now, listen, he may have not have served God during those days, uh, but he feared God. So what he's saying is, is you that fear the Lord, he is, and those that will trust in the Lord. Now, I trust God. I trust God with everything I got. How much do you trust God? How much do you trust God? Now, there's two things that help people to understand how much they trust God. If you'll trust God with all your possessions in life, and you'll trust God with all your money. But I closed a bunch of folks off right then. Let me explain something to you. When I started trusting God with my money and my finances, I didn't have much money. I had a lot of financial debt. Okay? You don't have to do anything but just understand what I'm saying. But when I started trusting God with everything I had, you know what I did one time? I I went to the Lord, and and I'm talking about trusting God. I I went to the Lord, and, 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 and I was... I was actually having to pay out more than I was bringing in. I know that probably doesn't relate to everybody, but it does to some. You got more to pay out than you have coming in. And I went and took every bill I had, and I laid it down on the altar. And I knelt before the Lord, and this is what I said to God. I said, Lord, you didn't put me in this situation I'm in. I did this all on my own. I put myself, Lord, in a bind on my own. Lord, I know I didn't come to you before I went and bought that automobile. But, dear Lord, here I am in a need. Everybody say need. I said, Lord, I put myself in this position, and I know you have no obligation, dear Lord, to help me get out of the situation I put myself in. But, God, I know in your word you said if I will call on the name of the Lord, you would hear me. And so, Lord, I'm coming now, and these bills that I've got here, Lord, I need your help. And I'm coming to trust you, Lord, to help me. You say, well, what do you think was going to happen? Well, to begin with, I didn't expect it to happen like it happened. Okay? But what I did was trust God that somehow he was going to make a way. You know what? I I thought, well, maybe God's going to help me to get a second job so that when I get off work, maybe I can go and work and and I can get myself out of a bind I put myself in. Okay? And so here I am as I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with these issues that is there. But that's not how it worked. I heard a voice speak to me in my inner spirit. And said, do you really trust me? And I said, Lord, you know I trust you. I've come in leaving everything I got right here. Everything I've got. I even opened up my wallet. And I said, Lord, everything in my wallet belongs to you because it sure ain't in a bank account. Everything I got, I'm giving it to you here this day. And the Lord said, if you will trust me, I'll see you through. And I didn't understand how he was going to do it. But what happened was, is that week when I started to pay my bills, I sat down and took everything I owed. And I first looked at my check and I said, there's not enough there. And I held the check before the Lord and I said, God, I'm going to trust you just like your word said. And I took God's 10% out of my check and gave it to God. I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you because I need your help. I'm trusting you. I gave it to the Lord, and I came back, and I sat down, 
and I tallied up everything, and I said, wait a minute, something's wrong. I took one of those, what was in that day, a newfangled thing. One of them calculators. And I said, something's got to be wrong with this thing. Because the last time I totaled this up, I was short before I gave God his portion. And so I tallied them up again. And then I decided to rely upon those old human calculators. And every time I added it up, I had more money than I had debt. You say, that's impossible. The Bible said, all things are possible to him that believeth. Mm-hmm. So you know what I did? I jumped for joy. I told Rita and she shouted along with me. I had money enough to go to the, we called it the dairy bar. How many been to a dairy bar? Oh, yeah, you old folks, you know what I'm talking about. To get a hamburger. Because God blessed me. And you say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about trusting God. Now, now I'm just touching on that part. Don't, don't misunderstand. Don't, don't say, well, Brother Boatwright's trying to, he, he's promoting finance. Listen, it's God and you that's got to make that decision. I want you to understand that, that if you want God's blessings, trust God in all things in your life. And so what happened is, is I learned a lesson that was there. And y'all heard me tell this before. And what happened, I went on my job. And here it was, I, I'd been struggling, but I, I was seeing God do things that I'd never seen before. And all of a sudden, I got a 50-cent raise on my job. Two weeks later, I got another 50-cent raise on my job. And this happened three and four times every couple of weeks. I was getting these raises here. And I told my wife, I said, I'm wondering if they just stuck something in one of them computers they got because I didn't know anything about them to start with in those days. And I said, and it just keeps doing it and they don't know it's doing it. Maybe they're going to come back and ask for it. But I said, while I got it, I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But did you know they didn't ask for it back? It was a blessing from the Lord. I want you to know if you trust in the Lord, He will be your shield. He will protect you about those things. And you know what I soon learned? The debt that I had created for myself was gone. God began to wipe it away. God began to take care of it. And God began to help. Because He is a faithful God that will bless us and help us if we'll be obedient to Him. So what are we supposed to do with God's blessings? Well, we think sometimes as humans that when we get God's blessings, we're just to wrap ourselves in His blessings and to walk around as, as the most blessed of God. But that's not what the Scripture said we're supposed to do with our blessings. What we're supposed to do with our blessings is to return them to the Lord in praise. When God rains down the blessings, we're supposed to send up the praise. When the blessings come down, praises are supposed to go up. It's supposed to be a cycle that when God brings them down, we send up the praise. When God brings them down, we send up the praise. And every time you send up a praise, a new blessing comes down. When you send up a new praise, a new blessing comes down. God said we are to trust Him. We are to praise Him. We are to worship Him as the living God because He has given us the blessings. So much so, when there was no food in the cupboards, God sent me food. When there was no money in the bank, God sent me money. When my family was sick and there was no money for a doctor, God sent me a doctor. You say, you believe all that? Let, let me just tell you something. I was pastoring up in North Alabama, and I know God was giving me a trial. You know, we go through tests. How many of y'all just love tests? I mean, y'all just love them. Mm -hmm. I was going through a test, and 
God was allowing me to go through some struggles because he's teaching me. You've got to understand, a test is supposed to teach us. It's not to punish us. It's to teach us so that we will learn to trust in the Lord. And we, we go through these tests. And, and I was going through the test. I was sick. My family was sick. And we were able to pay for what insurance we had, but wasn't able to pay for the deductibles to go see a doctor or anything else. And, and, and I was just praying. And, you know, one of my church members come by me and said, Brother Boatwright, because I've just been praying, you know, and, and nobody knew what was going on. But one of my church members come by to me, and, of course, this hospital is no longer in existence as used as a hospital there. It was called Lloyd Nolan Hospital in Birmingham that was there. And they said to me, they said, the pastor said, Lloyd Nolan Hospital has created a thing where ministers that are full-time in ministry that they will work with the pastor and charge him absolutely no deductibles for hospital and medical care at their doctor's facilities. I didn't have the money, but I had God. You say, well, why didn't God just heal you? God was teaching me something, whether he heals me or whether he puts me in the hands of the physician. Could I tell you what happened is my family, my wife and three children and myself, we all had medical care that costed us absolutely nothing while we were there because of Lloyd Nolan Hospital provided for us everything we need. Could I tell you, it even went to the shots of my babies that they had to have that I couldn't afford to get that my God's supplied them for me. You say, how big is God? He's bigger than all I need. He's bigger than any problem I face. He's bigger than any difficulty I go through. My God's a big God. You say, well, why are you so excited about serving Jesus? Because I've seen what he'll do when it seems like everything's against you. I've seen how he'll perform himself in the midst of his people when you'll stand up and honor God. You see, when I tell you I'm a product of Christ is mercy and grace, when I begin to tell you the stories of what's happened in my life, you can see the fact that it happens there. You know and you understand and you've seen what God can do. I'm telling you that God's a mighty God. He's a powerful God and He wants us to worship Him. He wants us to honor Him. He wants us to give praise unto His holy name. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry here. Uh, over... In the book of 2 Kings chapter 5, there's a story that exists there. And it was a man, and, and the king of Syria there, he had a man that was in his charge that was under him that was a man of valor. He was a, he was a great warrior, and he was a great man, high in authority uh, there in the, the Syrian kingdom that was there. But the problem is uh, that he had leprosy. Well, that they had brought into their home, into Naaman's home there, a young damsel, a young lady that came from Samaria. In case you don't know what Samaria is, it is a, was a providence there of Israel that existed over there. And there was a prophet in Samaria. And his name was Elisha. I'm giving you some names because those are important when you start charting the course of what happens to you during this story. And so when she realized that her master had leprosy, this young lady worked for the wife of Naaman. And she said to her mistress that was there, I would that... My Lord, which is talking about Naaman, was in Samaria where there is a prophet of the Lord. Now, when she told about the prophet of the Lord, she's not putting the emphasis up on the prophet. She's putting the emphasis up on the Lord. Because our trust is in Lord. Man can only respond as God gives him the ability and the authority to do so. Said, I wish that he was there and that the leprosy would be recovered or removed from him. Well, somebody heard her say this and went and voiced it in the ears of the king. 
And he said to Naaman, I want you to go into Samaria and I'm going to send a letter along with you and I want you to go there and have the prophet to recover your leprosy. So he sent a letter and the king here of Samaria was an ungodly man. Now how many of you thought that, well, God can't work in this land because it's an ungodly land? Don't you limit God. God will move wherever He chooses to move. God will move wherever there's people that will honor the Lord. What are we supposed to do? When the blessings come down, the praises are supposed to go up. When the blessings come down, the praises have got to go up. When God blesses your life, you need to praise Him. You need to honor Him. You need to give glory unto the Lord. You need to acknowledge that He is the Lord. You see, if you testify of Him, He'll testify of you. If you deny Him, then He'll deny you. we got to understand what the Word is saying. So Naaman takes a letter to the king of Syria, and here it is, the king of Syria. He there gets along with those of his counselors, and he says, I don't know what in the world is going on. He said, apparently this king over of Syria there that has come over here into Samaria uh, or sent this letter, he has trying to make some sort of quarrel with me. Who am I to recover leprosy? Well, sure he wasn't. He's an ungodly man. God's not about to use this in order to bless the king because he's ungodly. So the king says, I don't know what I'm going to do until he realizes there is a prophet in Samaria named Elisha. And so Naaman goes with his group with him. He takes money. He takes wealth. He takes clothing. He takes all sorts of things with him. He has those burden there upon the beast. And he comes there uh, to Elisha's providence where he lives uh, outside the house there with information of he's there to have this leprosy recorded or recovered. Suddenly, Gehazi, which is a servant or, or the aid of Elisha comes out the door. And he looks at Naaman and Naaman, and you know, here he is. He's part of the providence of the king of, of Syria. He is expecting this prophet that is spoken so highly of to come out in, in a royal robe and to walk over and to place his hands over the area and call the, it to be gone and for it just to disappear. But that isn't what happens. Gehazi, a person that is working as an aide under him comes out and said the prophet said go down to the Jordan River and dip yourself seven times and the leprosy will be recovered well it angered Nahum and he got mad he thought There are rivers in Samaria that's a, or or, I'm sorry, that in Syria that's a whole lot cleaner than that old muddy Jordan. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How many of us is just as guilty that when we take a look, we look at what's around us, we look at what we see, and it's all about what we see and what we think and what we perceive rather than following the instructions of the living God? You say, well, what are the instructions of the living God? Anybody got a Bible? Anybody got a Bible? Here they are. That's it. That's the instructions of the Lord that we have there. So here, Gehazi, he's listening to him. So in a rage, Nahum and storms off. He takes his group off with him. But somehow during this leaving in a rage, he's mad. He said, I thought it leaked come out and put his hand over me and recover the leprosy. You ever got mad at God? You got to answer just, I'm asking the question, do you get mad at God before? God didn't do it like you thought he was going to do it. God didn't do it the way you thought he was going to do it. God didn't bless me like I thought he was going to bless me. Could, Could I just make this very clear this morning, very, very clear. God is never late. God is never late. God is never mistaken. Did you hear what I said? God is never mistaken. And God does not refuse to hear the prayers of the righteous. 
Did you hear what I said? God does not refuse to hear the prayers of the righteous. God just doesn't work the way we work. If everybody else is like me, I got, of course, last night I set most of my clocks back where they're supposed to go. Got up this morning, went out and got him a truck, and got him a truck, and the clock was wrong. I reached over and I adjusted the time on my clock. Of course, there, there's, there's two things that, that every one of them is different. You've got to learn how to do it. And, and, of course, when you start setting time on a microwave and a, and a uh, vehicle, every one of them is different. You've got to sit down and figure out the combination. That's just the way it goes, you know. In fact, we're better off if we can find a, a six-year-old to go ahead and set the microwave for a clock for us. they got a lot better understanding how that's done than we do. You know, I mean, it's just the way it works. So here Naaman is. He's in a rage. All of a sudden, his servant says to him, Now, if he had have told you to do some great thing, in other words, Go down to the cathedral. Walk in and bring wonderful gifts and make a big display to all the community. If he'd have told you to do that, you'd have gladly done it, wouldn't you? And what he was saying to him, why don't you just try God? Why don't you just... Trust God. See, God's not afraid of a test. You know what he says? Prove you me this day. You know what Joshua said? For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God says, prove me this day. So what does Naaman do? He goes down to that old muddy Jordan River. You know, I can almost see him gritting his teeth. I'm going to do it because I don't want to not do what I was told to do because I've just been my own servant here just told me if he had told me to do something great, but I'm going to go do it. And here he goes, and he dips himself in the Jordan, that old muddy Jordan. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in muddy water before, but I have. Okay. When you go down and you come back up, there's a film that just gets all over you. Anybody other than me ever been in muddy water? Oh, yeah. And sometimes it doesn't smell the best. But he come out and it, nothing, I'm sure, happened on the first dip. Then he dips again. And he comes back up. And usually what happens is there's more of that old stuff getting on you. But on the seventh time that he went down and he came up, the leprosy was gone. The Bible said that his skin became that of a child. Yeah. You say, is it possible that God could use something like that? Yeah, one thing I want you to remember about God. God is not interested in sharing His glory with man, the elements of man. God is interested in you seeing that it's God that did what was done. So when He came out, and, and everybody, you, you, you're entitled to your own opinion, okay? Everybody's entitled to your own, so you just let me, I'm telling this story, so you let me just tell you what I think. I think when the first time he went down, there was a film on him, and he was probably thinking, I, here I am in this old muddy water, but I'm already in it, so I might as well just do it. And he goes down the second time, and he comes up. That second time, I think he may have felt something. Maybe the water moved a little differently. The third time, maybe he felt that there was something going on in this. What, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying every time you obey God, uh, God begins to do some work within your life. Every step of the way. You see, God's interested in us taking the steps uh, that he told us, because I believe this with all my heart. If he, Naaman, had a dip one time and walked out of the water, he'd still been a leper till the day he died. I believe if he'd have dipped six times and walked out and said, I'm tired of this, I'm not doing it anymore, I believe he'd have still been a leper till the day he died. But he did it the seventh time. 
You see, trusting God means trusting Him to the end. Trusting God, and this is what the Scripture says to us, the crown of righteousness that shall be given to all of us that trust in the Lord. It's not given to the swift, in other words, he that finishes the first, but it's to him that endureth unto the end. In other words, you got to finish what you started out to do. Naaman had to finish what he started out to do. So he dipped the seventh time. I believe when he went down the seventh time that he could have nearly leaped out of the water because when he come out of the water, he felt something was different about him. He looked at his skin and suddenly it, something began to happen. How do you know all that? Because now he begins to acknowledge there is a God in Samaria here. There is a prophet in Samaria that is here. There's a God that begins to move in behalf of his people. How big is God? He's big enough to take care of your problems. Who is God? He is the one that chose you, loves you, caring for you, and has made a way for you. Come on, instruments. Get to the instruments, musicians, please. Who is he? Well, Scripture uses a lot of words to verbalize and to describe who God is. In essence, God is all I need. He's my peace in the midst of my storm. He's my joy in the midst of my sorrow. He's relief in the midst of my pain. He is healing in the midst of my sickness. He is deliverance in the midst of my captivity. Who is God? He is all I need. I could tell you story after story after story. I could tell you about three Hebrews bound in a fire that God delivered. I could tell you about a man that was put in a dungeon, a dungeon of lion, in a den of lions, that was left overnight to be torn into pieces, that God kept him safe the entire night and raised him up out of that den of lions. I could tell you about a God who reached his hand and held the sun in place for a time and then released it to go again. I'm telling you about a God who can stop everything right where it's at. Who has the ability to stop everything? Who has the ability to hold everything? You know, we, we didn't have the kind of graphics you have now, but uh, used to uh, when uh, Batman used to come on TV and uh, as, you know, we, youngsters, we'd be watching Batman and uh, then all of a sudden that they'd freeze everything and everybody be in place. Statues there. How many of y'all have ever seen that? I mean, I mean, everything just freezes. I've often thought I wish I had that power. There's a few folks I'd like to freeze them right where they are and leave them just like they are until I could get a mirror in front of them and let them look at themselves. Yeah. How can I get out of the dilemmas I'm in? How can I overcome the trials I face? How can I get through the difficulties? Trust the God that can stop everything right where it's at. He can stop everything right where it's at. I'm telling you, I serve a God who can take control of every situation and He can change it. Don't allow yourself to be haughty in the sight of God. Think you're greater than He is. God knows what it will take to bring every one of us down. God knew what it would take to turn my life around. It was a voice from the Lord that spoke to me when I was in a raging fit. I was having one of my boat ride fits when a voice from heaven grabbed a hold of my soul and brought me to an altar of prayer. That I said, God, forgive me of my sins. God, God, stand with me, Father. You are truly the greatest person I know, Lord. Dear Lord, I'd like to say this morning so that all will know. You are greater, God, than an act of Congress.
You're more knowledgeable, Lord, than a whole room of Philadelphia lawyers. Your power exceeds the power of the president who with a stroke of a pen can write things into existence. Because when you, God, all you have to do is to speak the word and all of life changes. You're more powerful, Lord, than people groups around the world with all the armed forces of every kingdom and nation on earth. You're more deserving to honor and praise than all of the dynasties of all the world. I come seeking you today, Lord, for grace and help. For your word declares, dear Lord, that you'll be a help and a shield. And you know, God, what every one of us is going through in our life, how much we need your help, how much we need you to shield us. I'm calling upon you, dear Lord. I'm asking that in this service, dear Lord, that you'll begin to touch the hearts and lives of people. You'll begin to instruct them in your presence, dear Lord, to where they may find you as helping grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment, please. Just, just give me a couple of minutes here. I promise you I won't be real long.